Hello, I am Pastor Terry Roberts, and we're in a series on a book that I've written that's available in several languages, English, Farsi, Romanian, and hopefully some others soon, but it's called The Healthy Christian Life. And the whole idea is, how do I, with God's help, lay the foundation for a future with God so that I'm growing and continuing to learn and my relationship is developing? We spent so much time talking about the idea that just like a baby is born, becomes an infant, then an adolescent, then an adult. The same is true with your Christian life. You start where you are, but you're supposed to make progress. You're supposed to grow. And then last time I talked about Hebrews in 5 and 511 verse 6 2, where it talked about, though by this time you should be teachers, you need to, to learn the elementary principles again. And he lays out seven things in that passage of scripture that are elementary truths. The seventh one being on to maturity. In other words, once you've got these foundations laid, you can then build on that foundation, build a house on that foundation, which is Jesus Christ, and you can go on to maturity. So we talked, first of all, last time about repentance from dead works. And the idea there is it's not just repentance from sin, but it's repentance from religious works. It's repenting from the idea that your best efforts can save you. So it begins with humility. You turn uh, from your, your pride that says, I can do this. I can be good. I can please God. I can help people and give money and do all these things to please God. I can save myself. You can't save yourself. The Old Testament message is revealed in this statement. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. The Old Testament shows the problem. The New Testament shows the answer. The Old Testament shows the law. The New Testament shows Jesus. The Bible says that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus fulfilled the law, and he is the fulfillment of the law. And by doing the law, you can't get righteous. You, your first step is to admit that you're, you're a, a, a sinner apart from Christ and that you're unrighteous apart from Christ. Humble yourself and say, Lord, I can't do it. I'm asking you to do what I can't do. That's the foundation. Repentance from dead works. But you think of it this way. The second foundational principle is kind of like the flip side of the coin. It's one coin that made of two sides. So if the first one is repentance from dead works, the second one is to have faith in God. So if you're not going to trust yourself by repenting from dead works, what are you going to trust? Jesus said in Mark 11, have faith in God. Trust God. You know, we think about faith. <clears throat> faith simply means I trust you. You know, there's probably some people in your life that you trust, maybe your father, your mother, the person you're married to. But Jesus said, have faith or trust God. That's what Adam and Eve did not do in the garden. When the enemy came and said, did God really say, and he kind of implied, well, God's keeping something from you. Who knows if you can trust him or not? And so Adam and Eve didn't trust God. But think about what it says in the, in the New Testament. Abraham and Sarah considered God faithful, who made a promise to them. Even though it looked impossible, they considered him faithful, and they trusted him. And God declared Abraham righteous because of his faith. What does that mean? He trusted God. And God said, I declare you righteous because you believe me. So you stop trying to do it on your own. And the second step is you accept what God did for you. Here's what it says in Acts 20, uh, verses 21. Acts 20, 21. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. So that's like a coin. The first step is to stop trying it on your own. The second step is to say, God, I trust you to do what I can't do. Turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And then Romans 1, 17 says this. The good news, or the gospel we call it, tells us how God made us right or righteous in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. By faith, we receive everything God has given us. By trusting him, that provides the roadway for God to get to us, everything he wants to get to us. Salvation, healing, forgiveness, etc., etc. All of the promises of God are given to you through faith. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God because whoever comes to God must believe that he exists and 
that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. What does that mean? It means you believe he's there, but secondly, you believe he's good. You believe he's your father. You believe he cares about you. Responding to the, the love of God is what faith is. Faith is your heart's response to the love of God. As you see how good he is, you respond to that with faith. If you're having a struggle with faith, it's because you're having a struggle with the character of God. The more you know about him, the more you can trust him. Just like, for instance, if you have a friend who mistreats you, you're not going to trust that friend. Now, he may prove himself, and then you say, okay, now I have confidence in you, I trust you. But in the same way, if you want to trust God, you've got to know more about him. As you read the Bible, and you see what he's like, and you see God revealing himself in his names, and you see Jesus interacting with people in the Gospel of John, and how God loves people. God so loved the world that he gave Jesus to, to die for our sins. When you see that, you change your perspective of God, and it's the opposite of what Adam and Eve thought. They disobeyed God because they didn't trust him. You come back to God because you do trust him. Faith in God is faith in not just the promises of God, but faith in the nature of God. Who is God? What is he like? Does he really love me? Can I trust him? You know, imagine uh, being back in the, in the world. I remember so many times I didn't know if God was good or if he was doing mean things to me to somehow teach me. I didn't know if he was causing evil. I didn't know what he was up to. You know, people say, well, if there's a tornado, it must be God. I didn't understand all those things because I didn't really know the Bible. And then coming to the place of reading scripture and seeing what God is like and knowing him as my father and trusting him as my father. That is such an enjoyable place to be because in the New Testament, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The result of knowing the truth about God is joy because you know God is for you. If God is for you, who can be against you? You can trust him. That's the gospel. That's what Jesus' life portrayed. Look, look at me. I'm living out the heart of God. Jesus is the will of God in action. He was saying, look at me. This is what God is like. He doesn't hate people. He loves people. He knows people are flawed, but he jumps through that, through the, the mess to get to people. You can trust him because he's good. And if you're having a faith struggle, you need to remind yourself God is good. I'm going to read that scripture again because it's so good. God tells us, the good news tells us how God makes us right or righteous in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. And Jesus said in Mark 11, have faith in God. Now listen to this scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through, 18 through 20. As surely as God is faithful, my word to you does not waver between yes and no. For Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not waver between yes and no. He is the one whom Silas, Timothy, and I preach to you, and is God's ultimate yes. He always does what he says. Think about that. That's why you can trust God, because he always keeps his promises. He says, I'm not a God that I can lie. God doesn't lie. God doesn't cheat. God doesn't trick you. He always does what he says. He's faithful. That's what Abraham and Sarah believed about him. We're not supposed to have a baby because we're past the age, but God said we were, and I trust him because he's a good, he's a good God. He is the one whom Silas Timothy and I preached to you, and as God's ultimate yes, he always does what he says. For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with the resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, I agree, ascends to God for his glory. Isn't that good? Trusting God for the promises of Scripture is faith. For instance, if you're reading in the Bible, and the Bible says, God supplies all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's a Philippians 4.19. You say, Lord, I'm seeing in the Bible that you supply my needs. So I trust you for that because you're good. You don't just have faith in the promises. You have faith in the God who's backing up the promises. You have faith in the God who gave you the promises. What's behind the Bible? You know, this is a letter from God to you. And it's not just about a book. It's about the God who issued the promises. So what is God who made the promise like? Can you trust him? He said that he wants you well. He wants to heal you. Do you trust him? He said he wants to supply your needs. Do you trust him? He says, Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you because I want you with me. Do you believe that? Think about when Lazarus died in, in John 11. Uh, Jesus came to the sisters of Lazarus 
And they said, Lord, if you'd have been here, one of them said, if you would have been here, <clears throat> he wouldn't have died. <clears throat> and Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, even if he dies, he's still going to live. Then he said this to the sister, do you believe that? In other words, do you believe, do you trust what I just said? If you trust the Bible as God speaking to you, God's word to you, it releases you to receive all that God wants for you. The Bible says all scripture is inspired or all of the Bible is inspired, but it literally says all scripture is God breathed. Theo Nustos. It's the breath of God. God watches over his word to perform it. No word from God comes back to him without creating what he sent it out to do. That's amazing. That's amazing when you begin to see the, the Bible came from another world. It's recorded in this world, but God made this word, or this world, I'm sorry, God made this world with his word. And Hebrews says he's holding it together with his word. The word of God is God's breath. It's God's promise. You can trust it because you trust him. I love that. Trusting God for the promises of Scripture is faith. Faith is your heart's response to the grace of God. The more you know about what he's really like, you respond to that with faith by saying, I know he's faithful. It's like if your dad said, if your, if your dad was at work, your father, your earthly father, he said, when I come home from work tonight, I'm going to come home and I'm going to bring you a present. You, if you knew your dad and trusted your dad, you would an, you'd anticipate it and be excited about it. If you didn't trust your dad, you'd go off somewhere and play because you say, I don't, I don't think he's going to keep his promise. That's what faith is. Faith is simply believing the one who promised is faithful to keep his promise. So in the past, a, a relationship with God is seen as behaving right. But actually, the, Bible, the biblical truth is believing the truth about God. Listen to this in Romans chapter 10, verse 5 through 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 5 through 10. For Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of his commands. In other words, if you're going to keep the law, you've got to keep all the law. You can't keep part of it. You've got to keep all of it. And no one did except Jesus. But faith's way of getting right with God says, don't say in your heart, who will go up to heaven to bring Christ down to earth? And don't say, who will go down to the place of the dead to bring Christ back to life again. In fact, it says the message is very close at hand. It's on your lips and in your heart. The message is in your heart and in your mouth. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God or made righteous. And it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. Think about this. You receive salvation by believing in your heart the truth that Jesus Christ went to the cross. He paid for our sin. He was buried. He was raised from the dead. And that's proof that you're forgiven. You say, Jesus, I believe that in my heart. And I say with my mouth, Jesus, your boss, your Lord, you're my master. That's how you get saved. But actually, that's also how you receive every other promise from God. You know, if you look at the Gospels and you see Jesus going different places, it says when they heard about Jesus, they would, they would believe that he could help them. So they would say, Jesus, help me. Think about the, the centurion servant. This Roman military man had a servant who was sick. And Jesus walked up and he said, Jesus, I understand authority. And so you don't have to go to my house to heal my servant. You can say the word from right where you are. And I know that you have authority. And Jesus said, I haven't found any faith like this in all of Israel. And he said, go, your servant is healed. And the man was healed because he understood authority. He understood the authority of Jesus' words. He understood the power of Jesus' words. Faith is understanding that this is a supernatural book. The Word of God is alive and living and able to divide, uh, even, even soul and spirit. It's a supernatural book. It quickens us. You know, the Bible is from another place. It, it wasn't created on earth. The Holy Spirit spoke through people, but the words came from God. And God's living in his word. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. The message itself contains the power to do what it says. God's watching over his word to perform it. <clears throat> so think about what faith is. Faith is saying, God, I trust that you're good. 
you made this promise, and I believe it. So as you're reading the Bible, you say, Lord, you promised that if I would you know, do this, you would do that. You promised that I would, if I would forgive, I would be forgiven. You promised that if I, if I ask you for this, you would answer my prayers. If I believe that I receive, I can receive it. You know, all things whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive it, and you shall have it. So the, the parameters of our faith is the Bible. What does the Bible promise? For instance, people can say, well, I have faith, I'm going to make, you know, this so much money. Well, the Bible doesn't say that. You can't go beyond what is promised. You got, you've got to stay within the, the parameters of Scripture. Now, I will say this. Within your relationship, God will speak things in your heart to believe for, and that's okay. It's born out of a relationship with God. There's nothing wrong with that. That's real and just and, and uh, incredibly good. But your faith is based on the Bible. So think about it. The foundational principles of Christ are stop trying to do it yourself, and secondly, trust God to do what you can't do. Repentance from dead works, and then have faith in God. It brings me so much joy to be able to trust God. So let's go on. It talks about again, Hebrews 5, 11 through 6, 2, the foundational principles of Christ, repentance from dead works, faith in God. And then it says the doctrine of baptisms. Some translations say washings. But you know, when you think about baptism, first of all, it's not just one, it's multiple baptisms that are talked about. But when you, when you use the word baptism, I'm not sure what it is in other languages, but in English it's baptism. Well, that's a word that came from the Bible that we hardly ever use any other place. So we say, well, what does it mean to be baptized? It just means to be covered with or to be, be immersed with. If I am immersed in sand, I'm covered with sand. You know, whatever you're being immersed in, you're covered with that. And so that's the way to look at this. And it, it doesn't always make sense because it's, it really is a, uh, a biblical word. It means to immerse, submerge, dip, to cause by perish as if you were drowning a, a person that's being drowned in something. If I say I'm, I'm baptized in emotions, it means I'm immersed in my emotions. And so there's at least four different types of baptisms that are presented in Scripture. Um, if you were to go to Acts 19 verse 1 and following, Paul comes to Ephesus, and he, he meets 12 people, and he says, and they're, they're believing in God. They, they're believing everything they know. They just don't understand. And he said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. He said, then in what baptism were you baptized? And they said, John's baptism. Well, and then he led them onto the baptism of Christ, and then he led them onto water baptism, and then they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Those four baptisms are in Scripture, and let's talk about them. John's baptism was unique, and it's no longer necessary. You know the story of John the Baptist. He was the voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. And it talks about that in the Old Testament, and then actually fulfilled in, in the Gospels, you see him doing that. John the Baptist was a forerunner of Jesus. Before Jesus came, John the Baptist came to Israel and he was baptizing the Jewish people. And some of them didn't like it because it was a Gentile baptism. He was saying, you need to repent from your sin and be baptized and call upon the name of the Lord. And he was there to get the attention of the people to prepare a way in the desert saying, one is coming after me. He's greater than I am. He's amazing. And so keep your eye open for him. It says, the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom is being preached. And everyone is forcing his way into it. And Paul says this, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him that is in Jesus. So John the Baptist said, I must decrease and Jesus must increase. And it's interesting that Jesus, even though he was perfect, was baptized by John in John's baptism in the Jordan River uh, to fulfill all righteousness. It's interesting, I've been to Israel and I've been baptized, baptized in the Jordan River, and I've conducted baptisms in the Jordan River. But it was noth nothing significant about the Jordan. It could be your swimming pool. It could be your river close by or whatever. The point is, this was an Old Testament baptism that pointed to the Messiah who was coming, Jesus. Now remember, John the Baptist said about Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. When Jesus came, 
John's baptism wasn't necessary anymore because it was fulfilled in Jesus. You were only baptized by John to point to the one coming after. Once Jesus came, the disciples started following Jesus. And it's interesting because John the Baptist said, you know, I'm like the bridegroom. Once the, or I'm, I'm like the, the, the best man, in other words. Once the bridegroom comes, you know, the, the emphasis switches to him. And so John the Baptist pointed to Jesus. And so that was Old Testament. That was in the Gospels, but it wasn't a New Testament uh, baptism. The next one is what we call the baptism of rebirth or regeneration, our new life. This is when someone is born again. Uh, Jesus said to a very religious person, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You've got to be born from God. You've got to be recreated or regenerated. We can't fix you. You have to die and come alive again. That's quite a a straightforward message, but it's true. When someone comes to Christ, the altar call could be come and die to your old self so God can give you a new self. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. So the baptism of regeneration is called getting saved, getting converted, following Jesus, being born again. They all refer to the same thing. It says this in Titus 3. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing or the baptism of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. That's Titus 3, 4 through 5. He saved us by the baptism of rebirth, the baptism of regeneration, uh, giving life again. And it says this uh, from another translation, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration or the baptism of regeneration. It's a restoration of something to its pristine state or a recreation of something and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So think about this. When you say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit is the one who, who takes your old man and takes it out and inserts the new man, the new you, the new creation. He's the one that does the work. When you say, Jesus, I ask you to save me. I call upon you as Lord. I believe what you did and I receive you. The Holy Spirit makes you new on the inside. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says it this way. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. So when you say, yes, Jesus, that's the baptism of regeneration. This is salvation as it's taught in Scripture. This is the message of receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And this is the most important baptism. This is the one that determines whether or not you have eternal life. When you say, Jesus, here's my life, it's not the prayer that you pray. The prayer is important, but it's the condition of your heart that says, yes, Jesus, I humble myself before you. Make me new. Forgive me. Do what only you can do. Jesus said, you must be born again. I I could spend so much time on this because it's so important. But then once you're born again, you'll see in the Bible that they were baptized in water. Now we believe the Bible teaches, I believe the Bible teaches immersion in water. You know, for instance, uh, my wife was baptized in a lake. I was baptized in the Jordan River. Uh, We have right behind me a baptism. We open the, the doors We have it on both of our campuses, and we fill it with water. And after someone has prayed the prayer and said, Jesus, here's my life, we then baptize them in water as a sign of what happened. Now think about what water baptism is. It's a picture or it's a symbol of going into the grave, and your old life is dead, and a new man comes out of the water. It's a symbol of being buried with Christ in baptism. The same way Jesus went to the cross and went into the bowels of the earth and then was raised to new life. That's what baptism symbolizes. Baptism doesn't save you. You should get baptized in water because Jesus said to, but that's not what gives you new life. your, Your new life comes by saying, Jesus, I need new life. Please give me new life. Think about that. So water baptism really was the altar call of the New Testament. That's where people said publicly, I have decided to follow Jesus. Now, in many cultures, when you do that, you're ostracized and persecuted because that's, when, that's the sign physically, I'm following Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. It says this in Mark 16, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. 
Believing is what saves you. Water baptism is the picture that you have believed. Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So think about that. In many instances in the New Testament, people were baptized immediately. Now we have a baptism every couple of months here. So people who've come to Jesus during that time, we say, here's the next water baptism. We have a class and we teach you what's going on. And then we baptize you in water publicly in front of the church. We do it on Sunday morning. When we have a church picnic, sometimes we have a, a water tank out there. We take the day and we eat and have fun and, and baptize people. There's a lot of different ways to do it. The point is, water baptism is a picture of the baptism of regeneration. And it's interesting because it says in 1 Peter 3.21, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so it's not the baptism in water that saves you. It's believing that saves you. But water baptism is a public testimony that I am marked, I'm following Jesus. It says this, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him, think about that, through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Wherever you are in the world, if you have not been baptized, you can do it in your bathtub. You can do it in the swimming pool. You can do it in the ocean. It's a sign to someone, to people, to whoever, that I am following Jesus. The baptism of new birth is saying, Jesus, here's my life. The baptism in water is saying, Jesus, I gave you my life. This is my public testimony. I am, I'm telling it publicly that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. So let's rehearse what we've got so far. John's baptism was fulfilled. It pointed to Jesus. The baptism of, re of regeneration is the new birth. That's getting born again and following Jesus. Water baptism is the sign outwardly of what you did in the baptism of regeneration. When you were born again, you were buried with Christ and came back alive. The old you died, and if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things passed away, all things became new. Wherever you are, you don't need to, in this dispensation to, be, to receive John's baptism, start with the new birth. If you're listening to me and you don't know Jesus, call out to the Lord and say, Jesus, I can't save myself. I trust you to save me. And then find a way to be baptized in water. You don't need a special person to baptize you. You just Because you're the one making the decision. It's not the person. It's about you. So make the decision to follow Jesus publicly. God bless you. See you next time.